Hi, today we're going to start off our next module on standardized testing, talking a little bit about the issues in standardized testing and the history of standardized testing in the United States. So first, a brief history of the assessment policies in the United States. It all started with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965, which was part of the War on Poverty. Um, it was the first time that we were really delegating federal funds to education, um, which was really targeted toward these Title I funds, um, which were targeted towards schools with um, high rates of poverty. And when they were giving these Title I funds, they were really talking about and thinking about, well, if I were giving money to schools, then we want to see some accountability. We want to see some documentation from these schools to show that that this money is providing a benefit to students. Um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act has to be updated every four to eight years. And so some of these updates have included um, Improving America's Schools in 1994, No Child Left Behind in 2001, and Every Student Succeeds Act in 2016. Um, and they really provide accountability for federal funds and the tier system. And if you've heard that term, Title I Schools, this is where it comes from. Um, we also look at this um, minimum competency testing. So starting in the 1980s, we really saw this push towards um, keeping schools accountable and having kind of massive statewide testing for students, really in response to the fact that there were quite a few news reports coming out from schools showing that high school students didn't have basic skills like reading and arithmetic. So in the 1980s, we had a big push towards minimal competency testing for students to have these basic skills. And this is where we start to see that um, legislation providing two years notice for schools to provide adequate instruction. So what was happening was we said, okay, well, everyone has to pass this test. Well, since schools hadn't been preparing students for these tests, they weren't passing them, and that led to some lawsuits, which kind of led to this idea that schools are now also held legislatively responsible for providing this instruction. Um, then we also had some important um, publications that came out. The first one was A Nation at Risk in 1983. This really showed us that um, recommended tests to document the shortcomings and mechanisms of reform. So it was really this comparison, one of the first comparisons of the United States to other countries, other de um, developed countries, and it showed that we were not performing as well as maybe our peer countries, and really rec recommending that we use assessment systems to document what was working in our schools, a more scientific approach to education, and I'm um, using um, testing not as an end-all to school reform, but that it could help us shape school reform. Um, it also it helped to start to expand those accountability reforms in those district and state school report cards that we're so familiar with today. Um, but what happened was, because it was at a state level, we had what we call the state, the Lake Wobegon effect. I don't know how many of you listened to that video show with Garrison Keillor, but in Lake Wobegon, everybody, every kid is above average. Well, think about that for a second. Can everyone be above average? And this is what was happening at a state level. Every state was reporting that they were all above average. But by definition, right, not every state can be above average. So what was happening was states were all using different mechanisms, different ways to report their numbers, so they all appeared to be maybe better in comparison. Um, this led to standards-based reforms. So after the minimum competency in the 1980s, um, we started to see a push for um, standards um, in different disciplines. So in the 1990s, um, we started to see an adoption of world-class standards to shape assessment. So kind of thinking about how our standards could be um, could be improved so that they could be higher class, maybe at a higher level to really be competitive on this world marketplace. Um, so we also saw also an increase in our assessments that would be more substantial tasks. They weren't these minimal competencies anymore, but they were maybe assessing these higher standards as well. So we attached um, these high stakes accountability to these higher um, standards, and this is definitely a push that we've seen continue throughout um, 
<laughs> up until, you know, even this latest batch of FSAs in Florida, right? Um, we also saw in the 1980s the inclusion of all students into these standards-based reforms of these accountability movements. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about these standards. So the standards came from a couple of different places. The first place was from national associations. So things like the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics, the National Council of Social Studies, the National Art Education Association, etc. So these, these associations include professors of education, professors of content, um, so science professors, also science education professors, also district um, curriculum specialists, and also teachers. So these are maybe really people practicing the discipline who are part of these national associations, part of these task force who are writing these standards. Um, then there's state adopted standards. So things like the Florida state standards, the Texas um, standards, etc. in every state. And these are written more by political figures. So, so the people writing the state adopted standards would be a group appointed usually by the governor or by the state board of education who was appointed by the governor. So this might be a more of a political group. So you can see that these state adopted standards might vary greatly by state and depending on the political um, environment of each state might vary widely. And then from those state adopted standards, districts develop their own curriculum guides. So again, the quality of those curriculum guides might vary greatly depending on the quality of the curriculum specialists in each district and depending upon the quality of the state standards in each state. Then performance standards. So in the beginning, the content standards were just merely the content students were expected to complete. And then later, um, st different national associations and states started to adopt performance standards as well. So also what students were expected to be able to do in addition to what they were supposed to be able to know. And that added a little bit more specificity to those standards. So let's talk a little bit about the Common Core. Of course, that has been a topic of huge debate and controversy amongst the states um, in recent years. And um, I know that there's a lot of kind of confusion about what we mean when we say the Common Core. So the Common Core um, is in both English language arts and mathematics. So um, science um, has next generation science standards, which also went through a very similar process. And there's not a set of national standards for social studies or in the other disciplines. Um, the Florida Sunshine Standards um, are adapted from the Common Core. So the latest edition of the Florida Standards are really based upon the Common Core Standards, and there's very few differences between the two. The Common Core Standards are a national set of standards. They were developed by a group of um, appointed by governors from each state. So it wasn't a federal group. So it wasn't the national federal government saying we want to have a set of standards that are common across the states. Instead, it was a more of a grassroots effort from, uh, from states across the countries, really recognizing the need for a national set of standards to have more continuity across the states to collect better data from students across at a national level to see what areas of math and science, uh, math and language arts and reading that students struggle with the most to develop better instruction, to maybe better collect data um, from urban and suburban and rural areas, from different demographics. So it was really a way to help students, um, especially in our country where we're seeing more and more movement and. Um, from students across states um, to develop really um, a framework from for our country for education. Um, so it was never meant to be a place in which the federal government was coming in and saying this is what um, everyone should be doing, but more of a way to present continuity for our educational system. Um, it was also meant to involve national experts in the development of these standards so that there would be less inconsistency across states um, to maybe pool resources better to develop these standards. Um, it also is not an assessment strategy. So a lot of people, when they are talking about how they dislike the Common Core standards, what they're really talking about is they, dis they dislike the Common Core assessments, which is maybe a different issue than the standards. And then another 
complaint I hear about the common core standards is that they dislike the um, the way in which they're taught, which again isn't the standard itself, but the way in which it's implemented in schools, which may have to do more with teacher professional development or the district curriculum that's been developed around those standards. The standards um, again, and it's hard to talk about the Common Core Standards as a whole in that there's a quite a bit of variation between English language arts and mathematics, and there's quite a bit of variation depending on grade level. So there, in my own examination of the Common Core Standards, there's um, pluses and minuses. I think that the emphasis on early algebra and, math and algebraic thinking in the early grades in math has been fabulous. I think that the emphasis on um, a really balanced reading curriculum is a great thing in the early grades in the reading curriculum. So there are some really good things happening in the Common Core, but um, it's not by any means a perfect set of standards. Okay, so let's talk about the alignment of standards and assessments. So to what extent does testable material dictate what's taught in school? So you guys have been out in classrooms and you've been in field one and in your observations. Do what, to what extent do teachers teach things that are not going to be on the test? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? What are the pros and cons? I think our initial instinct is to think, wow, the teachers are really limited. It's not a good thing that teachers don't teach things that aren't on the test. On the other hand, we already have identified on the test what are the really key important things for kids to learn at each grade level. So maybe it's a good thing that the teachers are teaching the things on the test because those are the things we've identified as the most important things at each grade level for kids to learn. So just something to think about. We talk about performance-based testing. So um, another alternative to our traditional multiple choice type testing would be performance-based testing. So that would include things like doing, um, conducting an experiment in a science class to prove their scientific understanding, or um, doing an art project to understand their, to test art, or um, performing a piece of music to test their music, right? And um, it's this idea of, what you test is what you get. So if I ask students multiple choice questions, then have I only tested their basic knowledge understanding? Um, and if I don't test that performance, do I not get that performance? Which is one of the reasons why we include writing as a part of the test, because um, to some extent we believe that if we don't ask students to write, then we're not measuring their ability to write, which we think is maybe an important skill for students, right? Um, I would like to push back a little bit in that multiple choice tests can measure deep critical thinking skills, and we'll talk a lot more about that later on when we start talking about test construction. So what are some of the mechanisms in our Haystacks accountability? So, um, right, what do we, what happens to schools when they um, don't have a, high, um, a passing grade at the end of their accountability with their test scores. So it definitely determines rewards and sanctions with the school. So what are some of those rewards and sanctions? Um, eligibility. So when when a school has a failing or they're a turn, we call them turnaround schools, I think in Duval County, they might have eligibility for tutoring, expanded time, um, after school and summer school availability for schools and for teachers. They also become part of a school choice. So those parents and families who, of children who attend that school have greater options about where their children can go so they do not have to attend that same school the next year, which again, might have unintended consequences. So at a quote unquote failing school, which I hate that term, but a failing school, those parents can choose to have their kids attend another school. So what might happen is the parents who are most able might send their kids to a different school, leaving only the parents left at that, and families left at that school, of children who can't leave, which might in turn make that school even less able to perform at a higher level, thus um, hurting that whole neighborhood, that whole, in, that whole in, um, economy um, of that neighborhood and that school, and also making it even harder for that school to achieve a non-failing status next year. Um, sanctions can also include um, removing a principal, um, so at the district level, that might be where they get a new principal, all of the teachers might be replaced. Um, 
at the state level, there might be a new oversight committee at the district um, reassigning all of those teachers. So definitely jobs are on the line when we're talking about um, those turnaround schools, especially turnaround schools that have been historically um, at that failing level. Um, for students, the, the types of consequences for failing will be retention, um, not moving on to the next grade level. Um, at the end of the day, um, the graduations, if they haven't passed their graduation exams, they won't be able to graduate, and also the diploma type. So they might not be able to graduate with a full high school diploma at the end of their high school career. And then we've also been lots of discussion about teacher pay and evaluations. So sometimes teachers might get might be getting bonuses for high test scores um, and it's a huge component of their evaluation mechanisms and um, at the end of the year their annual evaluations and so we'll talk a lot more about that at the very end of the semester and teacher evaluations the next thing we want to talk about is the inclusion of all students um, in the accountability mechanisms. So No Child Left Behind um, requires that 95% of all students are assessed in our um, state accountability programs. So accommodations um, for these uh, students can include extended time, um, Spanish or other languages for English language learners, um, braille, large print, um, other types of accommodations that would already be a part of their um, IEPs. Um, so anything that's in a student's educational plan based upon the student's identified needs in the school can be part of their um, state assessments. So some federal laws that dictate um, students' um, standardized assessments. So we already talked about the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, um, which dictates the Patel One funds and was really the beginning of the um, state accountability systems. Um, Improving America's Schools Act, that was um, under President Clinton's 1994, um, that really started to increase the assessment of all students. So it was really talking about how we need to provide education and we really need to be including all students in our assessments. Um, no Child Left Behind in 2002 under President Bush. Um, this was a huge turning point in our education and especially in our assessment systems. It required adequate yearly progress so that we needed to show that every student was making progress, in a year's worth of progress, in every grade level, grades 3 through 10, um, through state testing. Um, and it was really talking about those sanctions that were happening and um, guided through that process. Um, and then really the first major update to that was in 2015, the Every Student Succeeds Act under President Obama, which really increased the use of the Common Core Standards, CCSS, and it was really kind of changing from you No know, Child Left Behind was the stick, like a lot of punishments, it maybe moved more towards a carrot with more rewards to states who implemented things like the Common Core and more rewards to teachers for implementing and for um, attending to and rewards for teachers who ha who showed increases on this adequate early progress rather than punishing the schools who didn't make progress, but still doubled down on that type of accountability and assessments. So some of the concerns that we see in testing, um, we'll just go through some common um, concerns about testing. The first one is that testing might only measure a limited aspects of students' um, abilities. Um, we also see that tests kind of create anxiety um, for students. They also um, categorize and label students. They can damage students' self-concepts. So how many of you guys in schools have heard teachers say something like, oh, I'll, he's a one or he's a two, and they've really put kids in groups based upon their FSA scores. And being categorized in that way can really hurt the way in which a student thinks about themselves as a learner, as a student. Um, tests can create those self-fulfilling prophecies. So if a student's not successful on the test, that can become, become something that continues throughout their student, their school career. So it's just something that's kind of always a part of what they do. Um, that because they've been a failure and because that's what teachers expect of them, then it just continues. 
Um, some other concerns might be the bias of tests. So we know that different groups of students perform differently on these tests, and the question is, is that because the tests themselves are biased by race or gender or socioeconomic status, or is that because the educational opportunities provided to those groups are unequal? And it's my opinion, it's probably both. It's probably some to some extent that the tests themselves are biased, and to some extent the educational opportunities provided to those groups of students are also not equal. So I want to talk a little bit about your position paper that will be due at the end of the week. Um, so it's going to be, again, you're going to submit it through Canvas, and all of this information is provided on the Canvas page and the, under the assignment. Um, it's going to submit it as one document. It should be in APA format, so that's 12-inch point font, Times New Roman font, one-inch margins. You should have a title page. You're going to include references on this paper, so be sure that you've reviewed how to do that in APA format. Um, these will be the headings in your paper, and I'll talk about each one separately. So introduction, again, short introduction, about a paragraph long. Tell me what you're doing, what your rationale for this paper is. Um, then you're going to connect your, you have a connection to the research and readings. So this is where I want you to think about what is your position on standardized testing and um, high stakes testing in the schools? What role do you think they should have? And then I want you to provide some connections from the readings, so from either from either the textbook or readings you've done for other classes, um, or you can do a Google search um, for some newspaper articles or magazine articles on this. Um, you need to have at least one direct quote with a parenthetical citation, um, and at least two arguments to support your view. So think about how would your view support benefit students or teachers, are there financial considerations, ethical considerations, etc. Um, and the section should be at least two paragraphs in length, so one paragraph for each ar argument that you're providing. And then you're going to have a connection to classroom practice. So this should be a separate heading titled Connection to Classroom Practice. And now I want you to think about, okay, so now you have this position how will this influence your classroom practice? So let's say that my position is, I don't think there should be any standardized state tests. How are you going to do this as a teacher? Obviously, I mean, maybe you'll say, well, I'm going to protest and never give a standardized state test. Well, that might not be practical, right? I mean, if you want to keep your job. So tell me, how are you as a teacher going to reconcile your position that you're taking and what you're going to do in the classroom? Um, how are you going to advocate for your beliefs? What are you going to do with what you just said? And then you're going to bring your paper to a conclusion. It should be about a paragraph in length. Then you'll have your references. Remember, your references should be on a separate page. So to get a separate page, don't just click enter a bunch of times to get to a new page. Instead, go to Word and do insert page break. Um, this should be an APA format that includes a hanging indent. So all of these things you can use your help on Word to figure out how to do. Um, you can go to the OWL Purdue website, just to, that's my favorite website on how to format your references for APA. You need to have at least two. And um, good luck on that paper. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm here to answer your questions. Other than that, have a great week. Bye.